Well, Come good on. evening, everybody. On behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, we are delighted to welcome you to our second Learn and Grow lecture this year. I'm Sue Boyer. I'm president of the board of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. And I'm filling in for our usual moderator, Judy Clem, our executive director. As part of the Friends mission, we want to help educate and inspire gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. To that end, this month, we are hosting three popular Learn and Grow series for three Wednesdays in a row. If you missed last week, and that was Tomato 101, Tomatoes 101, I believe, you can find it and all our previous um, uh, presentations on our website, uh, which is popcon.org, in case you don't know it. Uh, join us next week also when we will learn about the gorgeous plants uh, available at the plant sale uh, with our behind the scenes look and how to grow them successfully. In May, um, look for our talk with the West Hook Wild Ones to learn how to incorporate natives into your landscape. And again, dates are posted on our website. If you are not a member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, you might consider becoming one to take advantage of early shopping for our annual plant sale. As our biggest fundraiser of the year, the plant sale is open to members uh, first and then later to the general public on April 18th. So already our members are in there buying away. And then it's an online sale and they pick them up uh, in early May. This sale features a large selection of vegetables, flowers, uh, and herbs, and includes many unique varieties all grown in our greenhouse, the conservatory greenhouses, I should say, with the help of the horticultural staff and our volunteers. Before we begin, I want to remind you that um, you will be muted during the presentation to avoid disruptive background noise. If uh, there is time, we will unmute the group for conversation at the end of the presentation. But Kayla Chase, who is our co-host, our chairman of membership, and a master gardener herself will handle the Q&A. So please send all your questions into the chat as soon as you can uh, to help Kayla keep us on track. Now, I'd like to introduce our very special guest this evening, master gardener, Suzette Gason. Suzette's interest in gardening began in Michigan during her childhood, where relatives had orchards, farms, and gardens. As a teacher, and she's taught, from kindergarten up through high school, which is an amazing spread, I must admit. Um, she and a, a library, she also did many forms of gardening. Suzette has a special interest in native plants, composting, and attracting pollinators to gardens. The conservatory was always a destination for her family. She remembers the early days when the plant sale was known as the herb sale. It was held in one day, and I can remember the lines going around the quarter to East Avenue. It was so popular. She's delighted to be able to volunteer at the conservatory over the, these years. We thank her for sharing her skills and expertise with us tonight, and I now leave it up to Suzette. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, be sure to let everyone know on the chat whether you can hear me or not, okay? Um, I'm hoping that you can and that I'm speaking clearly. So um, I was laughing because if you look at the title slide here, um, I thought, oh, square foot gardening, okay, something with shoes. And then I noticed they were boots and wasn't that perfect for today's weather that it really fits. So let's go on and see what we're gonna cover today. So the topics that I would like to discuss with you this evening is we'll be talking about different types of vegetable gardens. Um, we'll talk about differences in gardening methods. I will also um, really emphasize square foot gardening steps. They're very specific. We'll look at some examples, square foot garden layouts. Um, we'll talk about the planting considerations you need to make. And then finally, I'll give some sources for more information. So let us begin. So traditional row gardening. Look familiar? Can we do better? Oh, yes, we can. So what's a better alternative? 
Looks a little different than the row gardening, doesn't it? Well, meet the father of square foot gardening. This gentleman is Matthew Bartholomew, okay? And he developed square foot gardening back in the 70s. And give you a little bit of history on, on Mel. He's an interesting guy. He was an inventor, a civil engineer. Um, he also worked with groups to have community gardens. And he discovered that the people were all excited at first. They're all gung-ho. And that as time went by in the season, the gardens got weedier. People weren't coming. They were neglected. So he started to ask some questions. And he says there has to be an easier way than this single row gardening. And so that's when in 76, he came up with the idea of square foot gardening. He thought that the ex experts would love it. They jump on board right away. They think it was terrific. Uh-uh. But you know what? The everyday gardener really got it and they appreciated it. And Mel wrote a book on it. Uh, he had a television program on PBS. I think it was on for eight years or something like that. And um, people really got into it. And so let's find out a little bit more about how square foot gardening works. So first of all, let's talk about the traditional way of gardening versus the square foot garden. So the traditional are good for vegetables. They require more space. So think about watermelon, you know, and squash and different things like that. They're going to be really happy. Uh, corn is going to be really happy in traditional rows, okay? It's preferable for people who have a larger garden area. Uh, weeding can be done with a hoe or a cultivator. And it's best for growing large amounts of vegetables, especially if you're into canning and so forth. And then it's also ideal for perennial vegetables. So think about asparagus, rhubarb, things like that. So how about the square foot garden? Well, you're gonna make increased use of gardening area. You're gonna have less weeding, less watering. You'll have a greater harvest yield and there'll be no soil compaction. And so, you know, in traditional row gardening, you start to walk on the dirt and with square foot gardening, you never walk on your soil. You never compact it. And you're going to be able to start gardening earlier in the season because it's going to warm up and even later into the season. And a few more benefits of square foot gardening. Okay. It's perfect for the small area. Okay. More plants can be grown in the smaller area. And you're going to have less soil prep in the spring. Now, when you initially start your square foot bed, just like with any garden, you got to do a lot of prep. But once you do that first year, it's going to be less and less work every year. So now you might ask, well, how is a square foot garden different from a raised bed? Well, there are some similarities, okay, but there are some differences. A square foot garden, according to Mel, has very specific rules. Traditionally, it's done in a four by four bed. You must divide each of the beds into 12 squares. You're gonna divide the squares by either using wooden slats like you see here, or later on, I'll show you a picture of one where they use string to divide it. Uh, plant placement is very important in square foot gardening, okay? because you want the taller plants to be in the back because you don't want them to block sun on the smaller plants. And we'll talk about that. Um, you can have easiest continuing planting. So you grow one crop and say it's lettuce and it's hot and it starts to bolt and you're going, well, I'm gonna have an empty square. No, you're gonna replant it with a different vegetable that can tolerate those conditions. Um, it's easy maintenance. And Mel says that your bud should only be four by four. You should have two feet if you decide to grow more than one bed. Between each bed, that allows you to get in there very easily and do weeding if necessary or to kind of get to know your plants better, watch for pests and so forth. You can add a trellis at either the north or the west end for growing vertically. And so you can see here, we have some people with tomatoes 
in the back, okay? And square foot gardening does require detailed planning. So I suggest that you make a practice grid on your own, and I'll show you some examples in just a bit. But those are some of the basics for square foot gardening. So let's get started. We'll talk about the initial investment. And I have to tell you that the other thing that's very important to have it really truly be a square foot garden is the soil that you use. If you follow Mel Bartholomew's method, okay? So remember, four by four bed, divide it into what squares? So you can see the beds wow. are all that I use here. Sorry. And so let's talk about the initial investment and then we'll talk about the soil that Mel recommends. Um, so your initial investment is gonna be the construction price or the cost to purchase boxes if you decide buying and preparing your soil, slats or string with nails and hooks for the squares, purchase your plants and seeds, which of course you wanna get from the conservatory, I know. And then you can also have a cost for trellis to either make it or buy it if you decide to go vertically in your raised bed. So garden beds. Well, the choice is yours. So you can see a couple um, commercial beds. You can see the one with the bricks where the person kind of decided to uh, create their own. But four foot by four foot, preferably 12 inches in depth. So you can grow um, vegetables that have longer roots. Okay, I did notice the other day when I was in Costco, um, they had raised beds you can get there. And this is the first time I've actually seen a raised bed where they included grids for square foot gardening. So they're kind of surprised. I go, well, that's cool. So the bed choice is yours. Okay, but what's really important here is the soil. And you're going to hear me talking about this as we're going through it. I'm going to be talking about Mel's blend. Okay. So the volume of, okay. So measure your growing area and volume. And this is where you need to do a little map. Okay. And so you want the volume of your space to equal the width times the length times the height. So for a raised bed with dimensions of four by four and one foot deep, you're gonna to have to have 16 cubic feet of volume, okay, your soil. And Mel's mix, okay? And this is what he pushes all the time, okay? And people swear by it, okay? So Mel says you have to have one third compost, one third peat moss, one third vermiculite. Now, Mr. Bartholomew suggests that you use four or five different types of compost. A lot of times when you go into a, a big box store, let's say, and you go in and you say, yeah, I gotta get some compost and they might have one called moo or cow manure or something like that. Well, no, would say fine, buy that. But let's look around for some other compost. Maybe you wanna get some mushroom compost, maybe some warm casings. And so he's suggesting you use a variety of four or five different types. And the rationale is that you'll never have to add fertilizer to your raised beds. Okay, keep that in mind. The other, the second third, he wants peat moss. And the peat moss is going to help you uh, retain the water, okay, and keep the soil nice and loose. And it allows the roots to grow down deep. Um, I'm going to mention right now that there is some controversy about peat moss. Um, in the United States, the vast majority of the peat moss that we can buy uh, comes from the peat bugs in Northern Canada, okay? And so they ship it down here, we import it and so forth. Um, but you have to realize if you do a little research, okay, that it takes thousands of years for these peat bugs to develop. And over the course of their time, they absorb an unbelievable amount of carbon dioxide. And so then when they start to go in there and cutting up the bogs, mining them or whatever you want to call it and so forth, they start releasing their carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Not a good thing. And the other thing is that to replenish 
what's been taken out of the bog would take thousands of years. Okay, so what do you do? Well, some people right now talk about using cocoa core, coconut core, okay, um, because they say that that's a more sustainable practice that um, it would just be kind of thrown away if it wasn't utilized. So that works perfectly. Um, there's actually rice hull that you can buy. And so when rice is being ready to ship out for you to buy in the store, the hull has already been taken off. And normally where that whole, whole boat, it would get tossed. So you're renewing, you're recycling and so forth. So these are some alternatives, okay? If you don't want to um, do irreparable damage to the peat moss. And the third part of his soil is vermiculite, okay? And he recommends using the coarse variety and that's gonna make your soil nice and fluffy. It, allows the soil to retain water. And in this case, the roots are able to spread out. So when I talk about Mel's mix as we're going on, this is the combination of compost, peat moss, and vermiculite. So you're gonna purchase the ingredients, okay? Uh, Mel's mix is top and it's lighter than dirt mixture. It's used for square foot gardening, one third peat, one third vermiculite, one third compost. Or you could try bagged raised bed mix. Um, but the only problem is, and Mel would probably tell you if he was still with us, um, that it's not going to be exactly perfect, okay? And let me show you why. This isn't the greatest photograph, but just for fun, I looked at a raised bed, organic, and I took a picture of the ingredients on the back. And you should always do this, by the way, when you're buying uh, soil, any sort of garden amendment and things like that. Look at the ingredients, see what's in there. And if you're able to look at it or you get in your store and you can see it better, you're gonna see, we might see some of the things that Mel is suggesting, but it's not going to be the same category. They also have it broken down because certain states have certain rules and so forth and so on. So I really do want you to look at the ingredients. If you decide that, gee, it's gonna be easier for me to buy baked soil, then please at least follow Mel's direction about using a couple different types of compost to add. Okay. So once you have your ingredients together, mix them up. You're gonna see in the photograph here that this is the mix on a blue tarp. And if I was just doing one raised bed, I could do a wheelbarrow. But if I decide, gee, I wanna do two or three, then I'm gonna consider getting a tarp. It's gonna make it easier for me to move that soil and get it into the bed initially. And remember, you're only having to do this labor the very first time you set up a raised bed, okay? You won't have to do this every year. And we'll talk about that later. You know, what do you do next year, all right? And so you kind of get the example here, okay? You're gonna mix it up, try to blend it as well as you can so that each bed gets an equal amount of all the ingredients in Mel's mix. So fill the beds. Get them in there. You're gonna fill the bud up pretty much to the tippy top, okay? You get it all mixed together, okay? You have to remember that this mix is light, so it's not heavy when you're shoveling it in, and that's because of the components of Mel's mix. Um, it is going to drain well, so you'll never have a soggy garden, okay? It's going to warm up in the spring, so out in my garden on St. Patrick's Day, I planted my peas and I planted my spinach. No problem. I didn't have to worry about compacting the soil. And by that date in March, it was easy enough that I could cover the seeds, okay? So dividing the bed is next. And remember, that's one of the main rules that you have to have it divided into squares. So you can see the one on the left, we have the wooden slats. I've read different things where somebody said, oh, you could use paint sticks and hook them together. If you get to the store, the free ones or yard sticks or something like that. 
Um, you can see in the other one, they use the string method, okay? And so they just have string and they just measured very carefully on the bed, you know, 12 inch increments, tie the string to the nails or screws or whatever to do that. Okay, so planning the beds. So how do I decide? Okay, um, I apologize if this picture is small, but it kind of gives you an idea how many plants could go in a square, okay? And there's different categories of plants. They're gonna be small, medium, large, extra large. We'll talk a little bit about that. But looking quickly, um, you can see, for instance, oh, let's look across the top row. They have garlic there and they said, okay, four garlic plants, one square. Okay. Okra, one square. Carrots, I can have 16 carrots growing inside one square. Hot peppers, one, okay. Kale, I can put in two and so forth and so on. I won't bore you by reading through them, but you can see like where we have pumpkins, they have one. And we'll talk about where I would place them if I was growing pumpkins or squash or something like that in a minute. So here's a possible layout. Okay, um, the one on the left is very neat. It's a four by four square foot garden. Okay, this person must be extremely fond of green beans. Okay, because, and carrots too, because they have two squares devoted to that. You may say, I don't really need that many carrots. I don't need that many green beans. Then just put them in one square. Okay, but you can see that you can have a lot more onions. But if I'm growing cauliflower, I can only have one cauliflower plant in a square. So you kind of get the idea. And then here's what I was talking about, how different vegetables are kind of rated by their size. So if you look at the far right, I guess, on your screen, you're going to see the extra small that with my radishes and my carrots. I can plant multiple plants, but when I'm over to the left of it, you know, the watermelon. And in fact, on some of these, some people suggest you actually use two squares, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. All right, so these are things to think about when you're starting to plan your garden, okay? You're gonna have to determine the appropriate spacing. And I don't mean the spacing that they list on the back of the seed package, okay? Certainly you wanna peek at that, but the square foot gardening, you're planting them closer together, okay? So that doesn't mean in a square, I'm just gonna dump my whole package of carrots and say, there you go. No, it's a small plant. I can grow 16 in one square, okay? Extra large, one plant per square and so on, okay? So decide what type of plant you wanna go and think about their size. So some more examples of spacing, you need to consider the height of the plants as well. If I have a tall plant, I want the plant at the far end, the north or the west, depending on where my garden layout is. And I'll show you an example in a minute, okay? Uh, so bush beans, for instance, are considered medium height. I wouldn't want them at the back. The north end, I would have them more in the middle. Uh, beets are considered short. I could have them in one of my front squares, but okra is going to get really tall and it's going to spread out. And I want that in the back of my bed. Okay. So remember, plan, plan, plan. So I would make a grid and divide it into squares. If you're seriously thinking about square foot planting and you need to know what you want to grow, how many plants you're going to put in square, what is the north side of your raised bed on your planting grid when you're doing it. You're going to fill your squares according to the plant's height. If you want to add a trellis to have your plants growing up, you want that either on the north or the west side. Why? I don't want to block out the sunlight to my other plants. Okay, and that's important. 
write how many plants per square you would use. For example, you're gonna have four plants if it's lettuce, 16 plants if it's beet. And you also need to determine planting dates. And the reason for that is um, if I grow certain vegetables, they may not like hot weather. So I wanna make sure that I have um, backup plants so I can maintain and make use of planting in succession, okay? So just for fun, these are all plants that are gonna be available for you at the plant sale. And so I want you to pretend when you're looking at this guideline that the top of the screen is gonna be my north, okay? So in the north, I'm gonna put my taller plants. And so on um, the first box up in the top row, you can see I put some chocolate sprinkle, cherry tomatoes. It's a big favorite of mine from the plant sale. Next to that, I have lemon verbena. I love the flavor. I love the scent. I like that it gets flowers and it also gets to be tall. So I'm gonna put that in the back. Um, I decided that I was going to grow heirloom brandywine tomatoes. Okay, very popular. First started out with the Amish. When, uh, Dwayne the other evening talked about the different types of tomatoes and this is one that he had mentioned. And then you'll see in the last box, I have the okra there. It's the Clemson spineless okra. I love the flowers okra gets, okay? And it gets very tall. And then you're gonna see in the next row going down that these are considered more medium sized plants. So we have some of our Swiss chard. Then we have leeks. I should mention leeks um, have a long growing season. So like 120 days. In fact, leeks can stay in the ground even after the first frost. So um, that's important to remember that that wouldn't be a bed where I could plant something else. The leeks are pretty much gonna be there the whole season. Um, then I went with the um, Asian eggplant that we have available and then the traditional California wonder peppers. And then in the next row going down, I chose um, Rucker's basil to use. And I think Dwayne mentioned how basils can be helpful in kind of uh, keeping some of the parasites away from tomatoes and things like that. Of course, I just love basil because it's basil, okay? Um, then I have the uh, shishito. Mellow peppers, I love that for stir fry and so forth. Always like to add a little color to my garden. So we have the orange glaze that's available and I always like heat. So I put in some La Bamba jalapenos. On my bottom row, this is where I'm gonna have more of my shorter plants, okay? And they'll be able to take advantage of the sunlight. So I have arugula and then I have parsley, and then I have oregano, and then I went with the um, Mexican mint Marigold, okay, that's being offered, all right. And so what I would say to you about this is that my oregano could stay there, my mint, but my arugula, that's not gonna be there all summer. Something else has to go in its place. So I would pick another plant that would be happier with the fall harvesting and things like that. Now, this was just a random, thing that I picked. And because I would not be happy with just one bed, I would probably have a couple, but that's my personal opinion. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of plant sale possibilities. I took these two because they're different. And they're different for a couple of reasons. Um, we're offering spinach this year with the plant sale. I love spinach. I planted my spinach, I think I told you on St. Patrick's Day, okay? And so spinach loves cool weather. So I happen to have started mine from seed. You'll be buying it, um, the transplants from the garden sale. But you have to remember spinach cannot take the heat. So you're gonna plant that spinach, you're gonna enjoy it, you're gonna eat it, but realize that you can't have it all season, okay? You could always in the fall, plant some spinach from seed so you have more spinach. But in the dead of summer, in the heat of summer, it's gonna bolt, it's gonna get bitter. 
and you don't want it. Now the plant next to it, Lovage, is very interesting. Um, Lovage grows very tall, so this would go on the north or the back end of my raised bed and so forth, so it doesn't block out the sunlight. The vegetation is very pretty. It does um, develop flowers later on. Okay, they actually attract parasitic wasps that are pretty good for getting hookworms and aphids and things like that. Um, Lovage is interesting because it kind of takes like celery and the leaves and everything and do a little research, but it's really gonna be good for your cooking and so forth. And it's very attractive. But the other thing you need to know about lovage is it's perennial. Where your spinach, you're gonna get a few weeks out of it. Lovage will last you. Okay, and besides thinking about specific vegetables, okay, I want you to think about putting in some plants that are pollinator aids, okay? And our plants and herbs can really help your vegetables produce more fruit. You want to attract bees and butterflies and all sorts of pollinators to your vegetable buds, all right? And so these are just a few herbs that, just, that we have for sale at the plant sale. So you have borage on the left, okay? Then you have rosemary, and then you have hesop. I should mention hesop can also be perennial, okay? So if you're deciding to use it in your square foot bed, just remember that it'll be with you next year too, okay? All right, then you might decide, ah, I'd like to do a little vertical planting. So I want you to trellis up, okay? And so when you trellis up, you're gonna think about how many plants you want per square. And remember your trellis goes on the north or the west side of your bed, okay? So they're saying, for instance, um, if I have a tomato, I could stake my tomato to the trellis and have one per square. Cucumbers, I could put in two, two cucumber plants in a square. Pole beans, I could put eight in there, okay? Um, some plants are gonna require two squares. Okay, they, to utilize. And we're talking about melons. We have an Athena melon that we're offering this year. Um, pumpkins, summer squash. Um, we have watermelon. Okay, baby bush we're offering. And winter squash. Okay, and you could do those in trellis up and you can see someone here has their winter squash up on a trellis. So let's peek inside Mel's book just for a second. And just so you know, I do own Mel's book <laughs> and so forth. I got Mel's book, God, I think back in the 80s is when I got my particular one and so forth. But I wanted you to see an illustration from the book, which is still available on the way on Amazon. They've done updated editions and so forth. Can you kind of see how he has the trellis working in the back. Looks like butternut squash is there and he's got the tomatoes staked there and so forth. He has some buds that are open so that they can start planting seeds in there, maybe for fall crops later on. And I like the fact that just like I enjoy it, I want some flowers in that garden to attract the pollinators. Then also there's another interesting thing, water wisely. Well, I think we know we shouldn't waste water, but we're talking about really wise. And this is what Mel Bartholomew recommends. You have a four foot bed, right? Buy yourself a five gallon bucket, that you, paint bucket that you can get at Home Depot or any other big box store and so forth. And do keep the lid, all right? Because this is what Mel does or did when he was planting and so forth. He would fill the bucket up with water. He would have a scoop, cup, whatever you want to attached to the handle. And he would individually water each plant. And you might say, oh, that sounds like so much work. Well, is it really? I mean, yeah, you gotta fill the bucket the first time, you know, and maybe when you empty it, you gotta fill it again but you don't have to drag the holes out. You're not gonna be causing mildew to your plants, okay? Because that's what overhead watering does, okay? Um, certainly you could set up an irrigation system if you want to, but some people 
decide, I don't know if I really want to do that. And so Mel says, hey, water each plant individually. And you might say, well, how often do I have to go out there? Do I have to go out there all the time? Well, if it rains, you don't have to worry about it. If it's really hot during the summer, yeah, you might have to go and do it in the morning and in the evening, but you're pouring the water directly on the roots of the plant. And remember, you're only talking about a four by four space. We're not talking miles, okay? And so I always would want my live there. Why? Because we know about the problems with mosquito larvae and things like that. And the nice thing about it too, is that the water is warm. And so it's not a shock to the plants by putting cold water, you know, how the water flows comes out of your hose and it feels good if it's a hot day for you, not so good for the plant, okay? And it's gonna save on your water bill. So what do I do when I'm all finished? Well, these are Mel's tips for putting your garden to bed. It says clean out your dead plants and debris. And in my vegetable beds, I always do that. My flower beds, no, <laughs> I don't do that. But in my vegetable beds, I certainly do, okay? And so I wanna take it out. Now, this is the perfect time, Mel says, to add more compost to your square foot beds or your raised beds for that matter. And so add a little compost in each box, smooth and level it out. You can cover it up with some sort of mulch. He uses leaves, I do the same thing. And then in the spring when it's ready to plant, if you have excess leaves that haven't broken down, just kind of rake them off the top, start planting, okay? So here's some resources that I suggest you use and that I utilized in putting the presentation together, okay? Um, I want you to go to the web extension because I am a master gardener through the University of Illinois. And so you can go to their veggie guide. They also have an excellent herb gardening guide. Um, and even though Mel's no longer with us, okay, his ideas live on. People worldwide do square foot gardening. In fact, they have square foot gardening days. They have groups on Facebook. I mean, people strongly, strongly believe in the gardening method that Mel Bartholomew developed. And you can go to the Square Foot Gardening Foundation, go to their website. Um, you can sign up and they'll send you um, a quarterly newsletter. Um, you can find out information about things that they do. Um, they help give scholarships to teachers for um, doing square foot gardening at their schools. Um, you can become a certified square foot gardener if you want to, okay? So if you really get interested in going, yeah, this is great. Mel's really got it. It's beautiful, okay? Um, a couple other sites. Being a former librarian, I love to research. I love to look for information and so forth. So. Um, Get Busy Gardening was kind of a fun site that I went to, and it's a do-it-yourself gardening guide, and they're going to have all sorts of ideas there. I mean, not just about square foot gardening, um, but gives you some ideas, uh, ways to garden, ways to set up maybe your trellis, you know, for a little less money. Okay, how could I do that and so forth? So that one's fun. So Get Busy Gardening. And then the one that I really, really want you to go to is... And I want to go to a road trip. I have to be honest, I have never been to Phipps Conservatory. It's in Pennsylvania. And it looked marvelous. When I went to their website and everything, and I was looking at it, they have so many exciting activities going on. But what they had that really interested me, and I think will be very beneficial for you if you're serious about square foot gardening, um, you're going to go to the website and be sure that you add the word assets there. And then you're going to see a couple of things show up and one of them will be square foot gardening. And they will talk about um, different ideas about plants to grow in the squares, talk about spacing, they'll talk about the height and so forth. And I just found it a wonderful resource, okay, for that. Okay, so in conclusion, I want you to read the book. 
okay? I'm sure you can check it out at your library, okay? Um, I want you to plan. And not just if you wanna be a square foot gardener, but anytime you're a gardener, you wanna plan, okay? You wanna think about the location where you're placing the plant, their height and all that good stuff. So yes, take out a piece of paper. If you've got a square foot garden in mind, well, divide it up into squares, but plan, always plan. And then finally, I want you to have fun shopping for plants and seeds. And of course, many of the plants and seeds we have for sale at the Oak Park Conservatory. And so I'll open it up for questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was great. That was, that was a really awesome lecture. Um, there's a bunch of questions in the chat. And so okay. let's, um, let's get to it. So Sue actually asked, um, she said she likes to grow zinnias that bloom all summer. Can she actually do that using this square foot gardening method? Okay, say this again. Could she, um, could you grow zinnias that bloom all summer using square foot gardening methods? Oh, sure. You could put zinnias inside. Awesome. Um, and then also just quickly, I know you said that, you know, they were selling them at, at Costco and let's say you were to build your own box. Should you be using treated wood or is there some sort of specific type of wood you need to use to build these raised okay, boxes? I definitely want to use untreated lumber. Okay, untreated, okay. Right, because you don't want to add chemicals to your soil, you gotcha. know, and my goal is to have my garden bed, you know, my raised bed or my square foot bed last as long as I possibly can, okay? And so you definitely want to make sure that it's untreated. Cedar kind of helps, you know, as long as it's untreated. Gotcha, okay. Is there a difference between potting soil or that like raised bed soil mix that you showed? Um, okay, so if you, uh, you know, and I apologize because I thought, oh, I'll just snap a fast picture so you couldn't read the ingredients. They're gonna have a mix, but it's not gonna be Mel's mix, okay? And I would say this, um, even in my own beds and my raised beds and so forth, I don't have a problem throwing in a couple bags and I usually go with organic is my choice, you know, but I always throw in just like Mel compost. Okay. I'm lucky. I do warm composting at home. I do composting on my own in my own backyard and so forth. Um, but yeah, I'll buy a bag of compost that I might pick up. So some mushroom compost or something like that. Um, I think last year when I did the presentation on raised beds, I was kind of showing the difference between a uh, pepper that received a side dressing of um, warm compost and one that did not. And you could tell the difference in the size and everything. And so um, I would always add compost to that potting soil. Um, I guess Mel's mix, when you think about it, um, it makes a lot of sense because it's light, vermiculite really doesn't weigh that much, you know, and so forth. So I guess you could kind of make your own to some extent. Okay. I hope that helps. Yeah, that makes sense. It's perfect. When you, um, before you mm. put um, the Mel's mix in the soil in, is there a liner on the bottom of the raised bed? Okay. Yeah. Well, it kind of depends on your head. Um, but I would say for the most part, what I do, well, anytime I put in a raised bed and everything, I would lay some cardboard, something like that on the bottom. And that our newspaper is my choice too. I'd lay quite a few layers of newspaper down there. Um, the reason being is the cardboard and the newspapers are going to break down naturally as time goes on. Um, but you're blocking out the weeds. You're um, killing any grass that might be there because it's not getting the sunlight and so forth. And um, then I just add in my mix. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, so when we were thinking about that plan that you made, and that was really a great example of kind of where every plant would go. Okay. Um, so for example, the spinach, you said, all right, you know, maybe use it the spring, maybe you plant it, you know, in the fall because it doesn't like that heat of the summer. Exactly. What, what else could I put in that area during the summer? Okay, well, if I want something 
fast growing, okay? I think as soon as I finish with my spinach, it would still be early enough in the season that I could put in some radishes. Might be good. Um, carrots would be good if I get them started. Okay, because your um, spinach is not gonna last that long. Maybe that's the ideal time for you to add in um, some flowers, like someone mentioned their zinnias or something like that to take the place. That makes sense, that makes sense. Um, so also Mario Kiersey brought up a good point concerning the plant cleanup at the end. I right. think now there's kind of a discussion around leaving plants for overwintering for um, early pollinators and kind of, or some winter interest. Um, okay, but I know exactly what you're saying. And I'm really a lazy gardener and I really do not clean up the vast majority of my garden. But the one thing I do clean up are my edibles, where my vegetables are and things like that. I don't wanna have um, any disease or anything like that that might possibly stay in the soil. And so, that's the one thing I do clean up, the vegetable buds. And any leftover that I have, that's, if the plant, how can I say it? If it wasn't diseased, I would take those plants, maybe the frost hit them bad or whatever, and I'm not gonna get any more green peppers from it. I'm gonna pull out that plant and I'm gonna put it in my compost bin. Gotcha. Okay, but vegetables, clean out, okay? Your other beds, like if you have your native plants or your other locations where you have florals and stuff like that, do not worry about the leaves or anything like that. But did you notice that when he was putting his bed to sleep and the same thing I do, I take my shredded leaves and put them on top of my beds to kind of protect my soil. Because Mel suggests that the fall is really a good time to maybe add some extra compost to your beds and then cover it up with the leaves. When it's springtime, you wanna be able, especially if you have wooden slats, to see those grids and everything to move the leaves away. Gotcha, that's a good distinction, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, there's another question. My raised bed had fungus and ants last year. Should I replace the soil? or maybe the wooden sides, or can you know I just plant the veggies within that fungus and ants? Does it matter? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> I have to think about this. Um, I guess if you thought they were carpenter ants and they were going after the wood, you might want to consider getting a new bed. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, unless I saw it in person, I mean, I don't per se have a problem with an ant being in my vegetable bed, but if it's causing um, problems to the wooden structure itself, then I need to think about that. Um, you're talking fungus. Um, I might want to start a new bed. Yeah, I also wonder if the fungus, maybe it seems like it's retaining <laughs> yeah, water. I, I wouldn't want to fool around with that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, another question. So vermiculite, I actually missed this accidentally. Um, is vermiculite acceptable for organic farming or gardening? Organic gardening, sorry. Oh, it's vermiculite? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It, it's small. It, you can look it up and stuff like that. It's no problem at all for organic far, uh, farming or whatever. Um, you want to go with the coarse type. There's different types of vermiculite. Okay. Um, it's preferable over perlite. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, also, someone, uh, Megan in the chat, just said that they had gotten Mel's book from the Oak Park Library. Apparently, they have two copies. So that's that's good to know if you guys are interested in reading oh, it. Nice Excellent. place to go. Um, so Christine, maybe um, Christine had a question about planting tall plants. Um, Maybe, uh, Christine, if you're still on the call, if you would like to unmute, maybe ask it. Um, I, I think I'm maybe kind of missing missing something in the question, but um, if Christine, you want to unmute and ask your question, that would be. Okay. Sure, this is Christy. Oh, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, regarding placing tall plants, um, and I'm thinking tomatoes, um, I know from your presentation, you, you would put them on the north or the west side. Right. And I'm just wondering, I tend to buy indeterminate tomatoes. 
Right. And I'm wondering, is does that one foot apart idea apply to them as well if you're placing them side by side or would it be better well, to maybe alternate tall with short like a tomato right. then a bell pepper then a tomato then a basil or something well some people swear but i mean they just said you know one square and so i take a lot of mel's ideas but i don't in all of my beds follow the square foot pattern <laughs> okay and so forth um just because some of our plants like you're talking about your tomatoes and so forth um do get really tall now with square foot gardening you want to do like Dwayne if you listen to his talk the other day make sure that you're planting six inches down taking off those bottom leaves and so forth um he was saying he uses a uh, stockings I think you could use gauze or something like that to tie it up but I'd want it to on a trellis or in a cage and that would allow room for the other ones now you know that they create a lot of shade so that's why you want your tomatoes in the back Yeah, and I would I normally wouldn't think to put them on the west. North I can understand, but west, then it's shading all my other plants from that nice intense after. Well, you, okay, I understand what you're saying too. So basically he says look at your backyard and see where the sun falls and things like that. And um and actually some plants would probably thrive longer if they did have a little extra shade. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Are there any ones in particular that would fall in that category that come to mind? Um, well, like for instance, we're talking about um, like lettuce and spinach and things like that. And so um, you're gonna allow them to have a little more garden shelf life, so to speak, in your bed. Um, and so that would help. Um, your root vegetables, for instance, um, generally, if they have started their, you know, like beets or something like that, if they've already put up their leaves and so forth, they're doing a lot of their work down below at this point. So if they have a little extra shade, that's not a big deal. Okay. How about bell peppers? That would be the thing that... Bell peppers, they want the sun. Okay. And so, you know, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a good answer to the question. I appreciate it. Okay. No problem. Perfect. Awesome. And then Mary O'Kiersey asked a question. Um, how about red pepper for ants? Um, Mary, if you wanted to unmute, maybe expand on that question a little bit. Um, hmm. Let's see. I know my mother always used to recommend uh, red pepper to keep ants out of the house. And um, I have found that some plants are not bothered by the red pepper, but the ants will be, and it will keep them out. Interesting. So you're like suggesting um, kind of like using basil to keep away the hornworms type, mm -hmm. type thing. Interesting. Awesome. I think, I think I might have asked everything that was in the chat. If you guys wanted to, if anyone wanted to maybe unmute, if I missed anything. Um, okay. Well, before we do that, I just want to thank Suzette for this great presentation. You've opened a lot of um, eyes, I think, to a whole different way of gardening. Yes, that we thank you. About before, and we really appreciate it. We also okay. want to remind people you'll be getting an evaluation by email. It's a three question evaluation. Please take a few minutes to fill it out tomorrow if you can. And now that we have about what? Oh, we've got about three minutes left. We can open it up and people can chat with each other or ask more questions they hadn't thought about yet. Suzette, you, somebody asked a question about planting tomatoes. Uh -huh. And uh, last year we planted, uh, we used a, a quasi um, square foot planting at Cheney Mansion. And oh, okay. we, would plant, we would plant one tomato in the top left-hand corner. And in the next square, we would plant another tap tomato in the right lower corner. And that okay. gave us enough space and it worked fine. Right. And did you have anything uh, in, out of curiosity in between? 
Or did you? Oh, yeah, we put basil around all of the tomato plants. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm asking. I mean, you yeah. know, because people will ask that and so forth. Yeah. No, we had we had great success with planting ba basil around all the plants. Okay. Perfect. Any other questions out there that you'd like to uh, bring up? Even if it's not about this topic, I'm sure Suzette can rise to the occasion. Just Maybe. Wealth of, in wealth of <laughs> information. Not, we, have, we have other people on board. Wealth of information. How do you keep um, rabbits out of there? Same way we do in regular gardening? Um, I would assume so. I know for some reason, I live in Galeway. And it seems like the rabbits like Oak Park more than they do Galeway. I'm not sure why. <laughs> There's an <laughs> awful lot of them here. No, this I, is have, I, I have a suggestion. I'm being facetious. Um, we do occasionally get rabbits. Um, I put up, they call it chicken wire, but it's not chicken wire. It's plastic netting yeah. and so forth. And so... What's nice about that is it's light. And so I just say the plastic rods and go through, you know, and because it's about three and a half feet tall, you know, and a yard tall, I mean, the rabbits really got to give it an mm -hmm. extra to get in there. I have probably more problems with a cat trying to get in my beds, you know, mm -hmm. than a, a rabbit and so forth. So I've never really had an issue. Um, I would think that you'd want something around it because I could see where if all your beds were square foot beds and they seem like they're nice and flat, that it's going to be too big of a temptation mm -hmm. <laughs> for yeah. your oak park rabbit and so forth. We had lots of rabbits at Cheney Garden. Okay. But, um, I, and, they, and they did start going after the kale and the Swiss chard. I started putting drops of essential oils, peppermint essential oil oh, on the wood on the bed around the bed. And that oh, odor was idea. too strong for them. They didn't like it. So they left it alone. Okay. Mm. That's good to know. Good because idea. and I like the idea of that it's an essential oil and you have it going on the wood. And that means that you don't have to worry about going out and having to replenish it after every rain. Because sometimes um, I will, like people will say, how do you keep something from eating your pumpkin or something like that? And I would, you know, have red pepper or chili pepper and I'd have it in water and spray that, you know, and it would kind of keep the squirrels away and, you know, other critters from doing it, but you have to go out and do it regularly. And so they had essential oil, it's a wonderful idea. Something I did, um as I have mine are three feet high okay, um, and they have um, like a ledge and I can sit on them uh -huh, uh, perfect. on the edge and, and the rabbits don't get in it, but that's, but I had to have them build up to three feet high. Okay. So okay. It's really great. Yeah, we had, um, I live in Mills Tower and we got Vern from who built the beds at, at for WTTW and he said, rabbits could jump up to a three foot bed, but they can't see what's on the other side. So ah. they won't jump higher than a, uh, they can see. Oh. Okay. Well, a very, very good thought. Except my rabbits aren't jumping too far. These are the biggest rabbits I have ever seen. <laughs> I think they're all getting ready to have- You got me. blue ribbon rabbits, all right. I'm telling you. Well, I don't know. I don't know if Ellen Cooner's still here, but she would use, um, oh God, the kids spray the water blaster and she, oh, would, I use that in my squirrels. Yeah, yeah. And she would, it doesn't face them. Yeah. Well, she said they seem to wise up after a while, but I'm, I'm laughing. I go, I don't think I can spend my whole time sitting in my garden trying to um, zap up. <laughs> it is a time waster, but it's somewhat it feels good after you're done. Sure, there you go. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> well, it looks like we've come to the end of our uh, time together here. Perfect. We want to thank you all for attending. I hope that you found something out of this, this presentation. I'm certainly I have. And um, we look forward to seeing some of you next week, too, when we have um, Sandy Lentz coming to talk about behind the scenes at the conservatory and uh, all the things that are going on there for the plant sale.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have Kevin. a nice evening. Have a good Thank night. you. Thank, Thank you, you Suzette. I always learn something from you. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you.